Hello and welcome back to On the Workbench. We've got a very special edition for you today. We are looking at a 2024 Ford Ranger Raptor. Not just any Ranger Raptor, but this is my Ranger Raptor. Took delivery of it yesterday. And so if we walk around the truck here, we'll take a look at a few quick options on the outside here. Opted for the standard wheels. I skipped over the beadlock wheels. Also opted for the standard uh, no optional graphics. It's interesting looking at the Raptor decals here. They actually are above the surface of the paint. I thought they might be uh, embedded below some clear coat, but no, you actually could peel that off if you really wanted to. Looking down at, a little closer at those wheels, this is the BF Goodwrench K03 tires, and you can tell that by looking right there. It says K03 in the tire pattern. Going around to the rear on the tail lamps here, this does have the blind spot monitoring built into the tail lamp. It makes me wonder how much a replacement on those would be if that were to get cracked at some point. Going further around, looking at that rear end, you can see we've got the beefy tow hooks at the bottom, dual exhaust, this has a V6 engine, also includes an integrated receiver that already comes pre-wired with a seven pin. and a four pin ready to go. And if we look above the license plate right up here is our access to our spare tire. There is an optional accessory you can have to lock that out. Looking underneath the truck, you can see a full size KO3 spare tire mounted to a steel wheel. You'll have to lower that if you wanna check the tire pressure. Looking over to the side, you can see in orange are the Fox live valve shocks with the coilover springs. Looking at the rear differential, you can see that very distinctive Watts length rear suspension system for your handling. If we move up and we look up here by the exhaust, it's interesting. You can see there's a fair bit of exposed wiring on the underside of this truck. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I feel like some of that wiring should be better protected and hidden away from rock chips and other potential damage. Uh, not really sure why there's so much of that exposed, whether it's there at that connector or over by the wheel speed sensor there. Just seems like there could be a little bit more shielding on those wires that are present. I'm really not sure what I think about that. Maybe some more electrical tape. Maybe there's going to be a third party solution for that. I would love to know. If you've got any ideas about that, put in the comments down below. Looking at the rear tailgate, I'll take just a couple of fingers to open that up, let it go. Dropping that is dampened by the little strut there. There is no torsion bar in between like you might find on a GMC or a Chevy. Also interesting looking at the tailgate here. Let me turn the camera around. And I find it to be a little disappointing. You can clearly see here it says made in Mexico. I thought I was buying an American made truck. Or at least it's American assembled from global components. Now looking at the rear, you can see we've got our power ports here on the rear. We've got a 12 volt standard plug right there. And then over here, we got a 110 volt or 120 volt household style three prong outlet. That's only good for 400 watts. So that's about 3.3 amps. Keep that in mind because your options are gonna be limited. Maybe you can charge a battery, run a small light, but most coffee makers are not gonna work. So if you're trying to tailgate with a coffee maker or a microwave, you probably need to bring an additional generator. This is not the option for you. I opted for the spray and bed liner here across the bed. As you can see, it's gonna be just as easy for me to do that with the factory option. I've got a four by two sheet of plywood there as reference laying down between the wheel wells that yes, you can get a full width sheet of plywood to lay flat in this truck. And there's about two playing cards widths on either side of that sheet laying flat there. There are six tie downs, three on each side one up by the back of the cab, one just behind the wheel well, and a third one right here. Maybe it's a little hard to see with the spray and bed liner. Optional in-bed lighting that already comes pre-installed. Some extra holes are pre-drilled. And if you look around the top here, there is the option that you can have a stake bed and uh, knock out those knockouts. And then coming back to the tailgate, there's a little spot here. You can put some C-clamps through to go clamp down work. There's a ruler that goes up to 50 inches that's demarcated in quarter-inch increments. Now, looking at this, one of the things that's interesting is if I stick my hand in here, 
and I go to move it with my hand, I can kind of deflect the metal of the bed there. So I'm not convinced how well that would hold up actually as a work surface. It would work probably not great, but your mileage may vary on that. Keep that in mind as you think about your investment in this truck. Really, it's not an investment. Cars aren't really investments there. Maybe they are for a business, uh, for what you spent your money on. We're gonna close the tailgate up here. Looking a little closer, we got the area lighting here, black Ford logo, and then down below is our backup camera. Because this has the dual exhaust, the optional sidestep is not available on the Raptor, like you can get on the Lariat and the XLT options of this truck. It'd be nice if there was an option for it. I wonder if a third party will come out with one, because I would love an extra step there for the truck. But speaking of steps, as we come around here, and we look at the running boards that are sprayed down with the bed liner material, it even says Raptor right there on the side. Before we go too far, here's the gas tank, push that open. There is no lock on that, which is interesting. It'd be nice if that actually locked with the vehicle. And we've got one of those capless gas tanks. Key detail right there, 87 octane. Also opted for the secure code keypad here. It's interesting how they put it here. It is body colored rather than on the A pillar. I probably would have preferred it up here rather than right here, but either way it works. That's an option that you can't get on the Colorado or the Canyon. That to me actually was one of my deciding factors of opting for the Ford product rather than the GM product. Now let's take, oh, now let's open the truck door. We can look inside. The first thing we're going to do is right here, and we're going to pop the hood. Coming around to the front to open the hood, stick your hand in. I'm going to go upside down. There's a little lever that you have to be able to roll over. Lift up the hood. First thing you'll notice, there's a prop rod. Really, Ford? I don't understand why on a Raptor with this much money, I have to use a prop rod to hold my hood up. I'm assuming there's got to be an aftermarket accessory for that. And now looking at the engine, you can see we've got our 405 horsepower V6 twin turbo engine. There is a battery over here on the driver's side and already some pigtails here with some of the wiring because this does come with the uh, six auxiliary switches. Some of those are pre-wired up to the engine bay up here. Some are pre-wired to the tailgate and other places around the truck. So we got some pigtails for where we can already uh, think about how we might accessorize our vehicle. We've got our cold air intake over here. And now to access our air, our air box, toolless access here. Just some clips that we can remove to access that. Windshield wiper fluid right there, coolant in the rear. You can see all the hoses over here. There's lots of room to get your hands through here and work this around uh, to be able to do maintenance on, on this. If you just pause for a moment and think about it and try to track down where things go, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out where you're at on the engine to make space for your hands and tools to be able to work on it. And then if we come back up here, you can see Ford Performance sticker here under the hood. Would be nice if there was something under here that said something about the oil weight that was expected to be on here. Um, kind of surprised there's not a sticker here that usually has an oil company on it or something uh, for that. If you're looking for your dipstick, that's going to be on the driver's side of your vehicle. Nice yellow dipstick right there that you can check your oil level. And then your fill plug right there says 5W30. So there is a uh, mark right there on the fill plug. We'll go ahead and drop the hood. Now, when it comes to dropping the hood, you have to make sure you drop this with a good thud to get the click through. I've tried dropping it a few times without a good thud and it doesn't quite always click into place. You may notice on this Raptor something else that's missing and that's the orange, amber, so-called Raptor lights. This is just under the requirement for those Raptor lights. That's something that I suspect a lot of people will want to add to this truck because that's kind of a hallmark of what a Raptor is, is having those Raptor lights. Now that we've been looking around the vehicle, let's go underneath the vehicle and see what we can see from the bottom. Now, starting our easier way underneath the vehicle, the first thing we see is those Fox live valve shocks. That's one of the key features of this that can be adjusted by the computer or electronically controlled. There are controls on the steering wheel to be able to adjust those for you. 
You got some pretty big beefy lower control arms there. Um, you can also see a fair bit of wiring through here. You can also see our tie rod in there. As well as the rest of our suspension components in there. If we turn to the side just a little bit here, you'll see a beefy front skid plate. All right, so if now from this angle, you can hopefully see that we got another bash plate here that's in black. It almost blends in if you're not paying attention to what you're looking at here. At this, that's guarding the lower part of your engine. It also has the oil pan tucked in underneath it. Let's go back a little farther. All right, so coming up on top of that skid plate, you can see that yellow drain plug for our oil pan. This does have the plastic oil pan. For it, I really wish you would have went with the metal drain pan. So now in order to change the oil, we're gonna have to drop the skid plate to be able to get access to that oil drain. Coming back down, otherwise, yes, there is a little bit of a slot right here that it could drain through in case any fluids collect, but that's obviously less than ideal for what you want. You want a nice clean install. Still like the bash plates there. It's better to have them, especially with a plastic oil pan, but if you didn't have an if you didn't have a plastic oil pan, I don't know that you would need it. So obviously your mileage may vary in what you think about that. I really wish Ford stuck with the good old fashioned metal drain pan. You can get into it from the side, coming around to be able to get access to it. Continuing to look underneath the rest of the vehicle, you can see we got some nicely insulated exhaust pipes for the turbo. We've got the rest of the frame running the length of the vehicle. Our fuel tank in the rear, our dual exhaust, and the pipes coming off of each side of that V6 engine producing 405 horsepower. Now, if we come back to the front, you can see the active shutters right there in front that can open or close, as well as uh, the drain plug for the radiator. The other thing that's really nice that's kind of implicit in this is I can lay underneath the truck without a jack to be able to get to all this. So that's gonna make this really easy when it comes for maintenance time that it's kind of already jacked up to make it easy to work on. I like that. I don't necessarily need to get out the jack to uh, lift it up. It's already lifted without a lift kit. Great. Now moving to the driver's side, this is on the driver's side front wheel well. We've got our front differential right here. If we're gonna to need to be able to service this or change the fluid, we're gonna to have to also get rid of this black or just temporarily remove this black skid plate for that. A couple bolts in the front here, a couple bolts there in the rear. It looks like four bolts and she's out. Uh, so easy maintenance to get to that, uh, as well as the protection from the skid plate. Obviously your mileage may vary in terms of how you feel about the skid plate, uh, but with that plastic oil pan, I'm gonna keep it in uh, just to play better safe than sorry. Now we're looking basically behind the passenger seat on the driver's side. And we've got a nice protection here for our fuel tank. Nice little bash plate for that to protect that. Although this bash plate, if you will, is plastic instead of metal, like the other one was metal up front. We've got some other protection here on the side for a, uh, modules that is metal protection there. We've got our brake lines running along the side that we can see nice metal as you would expect, but I'll, Odd that that bash plate is plastic. I'm not sure I understand why that wouldn't be a metal bash plate when we had other metal bash plates. Now turning a little bit over. So then back here you can see the rear or the main transfer case. We will transfer power between the rear and the front wheels. And we've got a metal skid plate right here to be able to protect it. That transfer case is, has a nice shiny aluminum on it, at least right now. And as we turn the camera a little more, you can see the dual exhaust pipes there for the exhaust system that go underneath the passenger side of the truck. Some other heat shielding there to protect the interior on the exhaust. And that drive shaft there with the bearings. Nice and beefy. All right, now if we look under the truck, from the rear end, the first thing we see is a full-size KO3 spare tire mounted on a steel wheel 
which is not an option for the regular wheels. You have to have alloy wheels, but they do have a steel wheel here. So if that's your thing, maybe you could find the part number for that and replace your other wheels with steel wheels, if that's your thing. But one of the more interesting parts here, let me move the camera forward a little bit. If we look at that rear differential, you can see the hallmark of the Watts link suspension right there, uh, which really sets us apart as a unique Ford vehicle. And then if we turn the camera to the side, you can see we've got the orange on the Fox live valve suspension in the rear, that that's available on all four corners of the vehicle. So we've got a nice set of suspension and components all the way around the vehicle as we look under the car. All right, let's take a look inside the vehicle. To get in the vehicle, we, we can either enter our code on the keypad. Obviously, I'm not going to show you mine on camera here. Uh, if you have that option, not every Raptor has that. You can also place your key in the keyhole. And you can use the key fob, which even has the word Raptor on the back instead of the Ford. And you can remove the key from that. Obviously, we can press the unlock button like that. Now let's go in. Looking over here, we also have our headlight control right there by our left knee. Under the steering wheel is our tilt steering control, tucked away right here. Not very obvious, but you don't really need to adjust that very often. As we get in the vehicle, you can see we're greeted on our LCD screen here. Now it's interesting, the vehicle color on the screen does not match the actual vehicle color. Would have been really cool if they would have actually matched it to show a color matched vehicle uh, on these electronic screens. Seems like that's something Ford could do or maybe have it uh, as a user option. So all right, so let's take a look around and see what we get. And then now coming over from the console, over to the center stack at the very top, we've got some airbag indicator lights and some other indications across up here. There is a speaker right up here as part of the premium sound system in here. Looking across the dash, we've got that same soft Alcantara across here and across over there, across the dashboard. We see the orange accent around the vents. It's actually growing on me. I could probably do without that, to be honest with you. I don't mind the accents on the trim or on the steering wheel. I feel like on the vents, it's just a little much but uh, certainly something I can live with. We've got uh, Android Auto, which is what's on right now. It came up, it's 40 degrees outside here. Uh, I've got my YouTube Music Connection, VLC. You can have whatever Android Auto apps you want. We've got our dual zone climate control. And right down here, we've got a nice selection of what I'll call hard buttons. So I can control the uh, heating and cooling system here change the temperature for driver and passenger side separately, turn on the four-way blinkers, air recirculation fan, and the radio or speaker knob to be able to turn that up or down. That's really nice. And you can see this also has wireless play because I have nothing hooked in right down under here. There is a set of USB ports and a wireless phone charger. I really like that wireless phone charger and it's vented. You see those little pads in between to let air go through and on the side so that air can circulate and keep your phone cool while it's charging. Really nicely well thought out. So now we'll go up a little bit higher over here, right? Basically above the driver's knee is a trailer brake controller. So if you're towing, you can use that to adjust your trailer brakes. And then now coming back, we've got our E shifter. It's a little bit weird how short this is. It basically fits in the palm of my hand rather nicely. It'll uh, illuminate there. It's a little bit weird and awkward to use if you've got to make a three or four or five point turn getting out of a situation. Also of note on the side, there is the M manual mode button there for drive, which then enables the paddle shifters that are located here and here on the steering wheel so you can adjust that 10 speed transmission accordingly. Going back over here, we've got an electronic parking brake. And then over here, we've got our mode select. So we've got four high, four automatic, two high, and four low, as well as trailer mode. And we can also change our driving modes on our screen. Let's see if I can switch through this. There we go. We've got normal. We've got off-road. 
Baja, Rock Crawl. Let me go back the other way. This does not cycle like a circle all the way through. Off-road, back to normal, Sport, Toe Haul, Slippery. Uh, I'm surprised they don't have an Eco mode on here. I thought there would have been an Eco mode in the truck, but there's not. I'm okay with that. I didn't buy a Raptor specifically for Eco mode, obviously. Now let's move down here to the steering wheel and look at the buttons. It looks like there's a, quite a few buttons here. So let's start here on the driver's, or on my right. There's a little steering wheel here if I tap on that. Actually, I'm about to start the truck up, so let me go ahead and step on the brake and press the auto start stop. There we go, vehicle is on. And you can see some of my latest trip numbers here, getting 14.9 miles per gallon, uh, with an average speed of 19 miles per hour. That's fine. So now going down the steering wheel here, first button right here, press this button right here. So steering, we've got normal, comfort, and sport. We'll go back to normal. Now what looks like a shock, we'll press that. We've got normal, sport, and off-road. Let's go back to normal. And then we've got what I think looks like a whistle, which is our exhaust mode. So we can change the sound of our exhaust, sport, Baja, which will give you a warning for off-road use only. There we go. And quiet and normal. I never ever ran it in quiet. It just feels like the truck doesn't perform as well. I don't have any hard data on that. It just feels like it's maybe a little less performance on that. Uh, again, just my feeling. Uh, and then the next button over here is we've got an R Raptor mode that we can use to store our settings for how we want our console to look. There's only one setting here for this, so I can enable that by double tapping the Raptor button like that. It's going to sit here and put it back into the driving mode. I've got it set to auto or to deactivate the auto stop start, and then the R becomes illuminated right there. But we can also continue to change this. So this button right here will allow us to change what's basically in the middle of our screen here. We've got our odometer for trip one and trip two. We can check out fuel economy. And so you can have a live gauge of how you're doing on your fuel economy uh, while you're going. It's got a little uh, R graphic in the bed of the truck there. It's kind of interesting. Let me go back. We can look at that auto start stop and enable or disable that from this menu here. We can look at seat belts and see inside the vehicle what is and is not buckled. One of the back seat is the car safety or is the child seat. You'll see that in a bit. Go back. Driver assistance. And that does so far very little. But let me go back up. There we go, back to the main menu. We also have some other options here. We could have a navigation screen right here in the middle. So you can run that here. You can also connect to your phone. The one button here that's missing is a hang up and call button here. I really wish there was a hard hang up button on the steering wheel. We can also have it display audio information here, settings, so we can configure uh, a secondary speedometer, turn-by-turn -turn indications, performance shift indicators. Let me go back there, configure the gauges. And so we can change what is showing where. So on the left side right now, it's showing me a tachometer. Uh, but I could change that to vacuum boost. We'll set that the battery voltage. So that's changed it right up there above, not necessarily right there. Change it to vacuum boost. Oil pressure. Go to the right selectable gauge. I've got transmission temperature there. You can't duplicate a gauge on both of them. That's why there's a lockout there. Battery voltage. You can see we're good right there. So we've got some options right there for what we want to configure. If I click the secondary speedometer, 
Now it shows both standard and metric miles per hour and kilometers per hour. I will disable the kilometers per hour. Under the vehicle maintenance menu, I can sit here and pull up tire pressure on all four wheels. It, uh, by the book, it should be 39. These are maybe a little running a little bit high. Let's go back here, engine information. That we've got 20 hours on the engine, including six idle hours. That seems like a lot right now uh, out of that 20. A lot of it's been people just wanting to look at my truck and my friends coming over to look at it. Uh, oil life, 98%. I would never go by that. I like the actual mileage and going by that. And obviously my first oil change is going to be sooner than by the book. Let me go back. Oil life, more specifically, 98%. You can hold to reset that automatically without needing the special tool to do that. That's nice. Go back from vehicle maintenance. What you may not have seen here is the ability to actually have your speedometer only in metric, which I find to be a little odd because some folks may only want it in metric if that's how they were raised. But obviously your speed limits you see on the side of the road in the US are only, for the most part, in miles per hour. Now, if we click on this My View, there is, uh, so here's this setup here. We can also set it up, Let's see, all right, there we go, trip fuel, Let me see if I can find it back. There is a so-called quiet mode to hide some of these gauges here. I'm trying to find where that went. Now, if we go to the off-road display here, this will give us other interesting numbers here so we can see off-road status. That shows our differential and our pitch and roll. Raptor status. So this shows our steering, suspension, drive mode, exhaust, and everything else here. There we go. Pitch and roll indications here. Kind of like a compass to know if you're leaning forward or backward, left to right. My gauges. And we can sit here and scroll through all the different numbers there. Uh, let's go back to measurements. There we go. On our gauges. So off-road's got some good stuff there. Somewhere in here, there is a quiet screen. I'm obviously not figuring out how to get to it right there. I saw it once earlier uh, that basically will remove everything except for uh, the two big gauges right here and right there. So you can see your speed and your uh, driver gear. All right, so that covers everything on the right side of the steering wheel. On the left side of the steering wheel, we've got a couple of easy ones here, volume up and, or up and down. Then we've got the speaking icon here. So what's interesting about this is if you press it once, it's forward sync. If you press and hold it longer, you can get Google. So if I tap right now and I press it once, It comes over here and pulls up the Ford sync screen. Cancel. Please try again. Now I'm going to tap and hold this. Tap and hold. Hello, Google. Tell me a joke. Sorry, I didn't understand. Obviously, you heard that was Google there. So then we've got those right there. And then now over here, we've got controls for our cruise control. We also have our lane keep assist. Lane keep system on or off. It actually will change and put an indicator right down here in the lower corner of the dash. Now it's interesting right now because I'm on the driveway and the cameras can't detect if there's any lines, so it's blank. Otherwise it'll go green if it sees lines and it can guide your steering, so to speak, left to right to help you stay within the lines uh, for what we might call lane centering. Now, if we go up on top, we've got the controls for our cruise control as well as the speed limiter. Now, the speed limiter here is interesting 
because if you look over here in the corner, it's a little green rectangle popping up. It'll try to identify what the most recent speed limit sign that you passed was, and it'll usually try to match that. In a perfect world to me, I would love to be able to set this to say 75 or 80, what I think is a reasonable upper speed on the interstate, and have it always be there and then chime if I go over it. But this will reset that limit to whatever the speed limit was every time you go. Um, and then it'll throttle your engine back whenever you hit it. So I wish there was a way that that would be a little more configurable um, just to make it work a little bit better, at least in my opinion, for how I want it to work. And then also looking on the steering wheel, we've got our paddle controllers on the side. We've got our turn signal stock here on the side. One of the things I like about this this actually has a nice distance here. I know about 10 years ago, I drove a Ford Fusion uh, uh, for work quite a bit, and that turn signal stock was so far back, I felt like I was always having to stretch my hand out to reach it, but that's a very nice, comfortable distance. Over here on the side, we've got our wiper controls and our variable speed options here for our wipers. Now, going over to the driver's side door card, we've got our lock unlock button three driver position memory seat settings. Down here, we've got our window settings. For uh, all four windows, we've got our mirror adjustments to be able to control the driver side mirror, like that, the passenger side mirror there. We can also prevent people from uh, lowering the other uh, windows, and we can also fold in our mirrors just with the press of a button. Now on these Windows here, you just tap the button once and it'll hold. If I hold it down a bit, it will go all the way down. And then it is one touch up, just like that. So that's nice. Leather here on the door card here. Now let's go around over here on the passenger side. You can see we've got the lock unlock button. But what else is missing over here that you'll see all around the vehicle. Nowhere is there a lever or manual control of the locks. All the locks are, are auto. So there's no way that you can individually uh, lift a lever. So hypothetically, if you locked yourself out, you can't actually fish something in to unlock it. You'd have to tap the soft button and hope the battery still works. Now let's go in between the seats. We've got our, our armrest here. This is not adjustable frontwards or backwards. Some cars, is, this will slide forward or back. Lift it up, we've got a tray. And then at the bottom, we've got a 12 volt socket right here that you could use to put something in it. Pretty basic. And I will just go ahead and put a sunglass case back in there. I missed one thing right here. Let me turn the camera around. Also right here on the center console here beside the drive mode, we've got our electronic parking brake controller and then we also have the auto start stop button. And what I thought was interesting, when I first got my window sticker, it said that the auto start stop had been removed. So I didn't think that was gonna be an issue for me, but that is a feature that uh, I'm not sure anybody actually asked for in any of these vehicles, to be fair. Uh, we also have a traction control option to disable that. And we also have an option for auto parking assist where it can basically self park. I've not experimented with that, I'm not sure I trust an AI system or something else to park the truck for me. And then we have an off-road button here that if I press this, it'll change my center screen here and I can see my forward-facing camera. And it shows me my tire pressure. I got easy one-click access to lock my front, my rear differential, tap there in the middle for trail control. And that trail control is, for, is basically your off-road cruise control, if you will. And you also have an ability to activate or deactivate the parking alerts, because uh, it will chime if it thinks it's getting, if, if you're getting too close to a building or a structure or other obstruction. And so you got a nice little view here of what's going on in all four corners of your vehicle. We'll tap it again, and that'll pull that off. So now up top, we've got our driver's side visor. It does have a light at mirror. And one of the other things I like about this that is not available in the Chevy or the GMC is this does have the Homelink garage door 
opener control built in. That was one of the features that really helped me choose the Ford versus Chevy or GMC debate is I really wanted this and I wanted the uh, keypad on the door to open it. All right, so then moving over here, we've got, I don't know, our overhead center stack, if you will. So we've got map lights or reading lights, just simply tap them on and off. And then we've got a couple buttons up here. We've got auto or off on our lights. And then up here is how we would open our rear sliding window. Just like that. Then I will close it. There is no sunroof on this truck. There is the power rear glass. So then moving back here, we've got our sunglass holder here. Maybe you could store two pairs, but I think it's probably best for just one pair of sunglasses. And then we have our six auxiliary switches right here. These are pre-wired to various points around the truck, uh, either perhaps for extra lights in the rear, the front, uh, or otherwise. That each of these has a specific wiring destination. Check your owner's manual uh, on where each of those ends terminates at. Looking at the rear view mirror, there is no switch here. This is an auto darkening or adjusting mirror. And that takes us through the front seat. Now, if we look at the floor, this does come with the all weather floor mats. It was interesting, when I lifted up mine, I actually also had the carpeted floor mats. I was kind of surprised. I thought I would get these in lieu of it, but I've also got the set of the carpet floor mats if I want to pull these out and go with carpet. I like the all-weather floor mats because I can hose them down, clean them off, and be good to go again, rather than carpet that, well, it's carpet, so you've got to clean it. All right, now let's take a look around the rear of the vehicle. If I open this up, looking around the rear, so I actually have a child safety seat in my truck here. Now that was kind of a pain to install because of the latch and that upper latch has to go over the back of the seat. And the back of the seat is one continuous seat back here. This does not have a 60-40 split. So if you've got to install two child safety seats in the rear of your truck, that's probably gonna be a bit of a pain, but it does have the latch compatible anchors at the rear or at the bottom part there. In the middle, you can pull out your, an extra armrest and dual cup holder. That goes back up there. Uh, this center headrest is adjustable up. Obviously, as you pull it up, it's gonna impact how your ability to actually see out your rear view mirror. Push the button, push it down, tuck it out of the way. Now, the other part that's interesting is if you wanna fold down this back seat, which does fold flat, the strap to do so is on the passenger side, which I thought was odd. I would rather that been on the driver's side. So if I get out of the driver's side and I want to fold my seat back or my the rear seat back down, I either have to reach uh, two thirds of the way across the truck or walk around to flatten it out. Not really sure why they put it there as opposed to over here. My only answer is in Australia where this truck was mostly designed the driver is on the other side, and maybe that's a detail they didn't flip for North America. Looking around, you can also see the rear seats are in a thick, seat belts are in a fixed, non-adjustable position. It would be nice if they could go up or down and make those adjustable uh, for kids. If we look at the front seat belts, these are adjustable. We can pull these clips here to raise or lower the seat belts to get the optimal height of, uh, of them on your body. We've got map, or our, and then on the seat backs, we've got map pockets where you could fit a Atlas, if you will, if you remember driving with those. And then also looking back here at the rear, we've got our 110 volt, 400 watt outlet and a USB-A and USB-C charge ports there. Now that 400 watts, that's just a little over three amps. So just pay attention, that's good for Charging some small electronics, and that's about it. You're not going to be able to run a coffee maker on that at all. You'll need a separate generator or power source for that. I feel like that's one option that I really wish Ford would have added to this, is to be able to have heavy-duty power. Coming up here on this rear stack, there's this little uh, storage slot there. 
charge slot. Maybe you lay your phone there while it's charging. But on the international version of this truck, that's where the rear AC vents are. I don't know why they had to use a different part for North America. It seems like it would have been cheaper to have the same part all the way around the world. Uh, but I digress. Uh, there is rear heating and cooling, if you will. You have to look underneath the driver or the passenger seat. And there is a vent stashed away right down there. It might be kind of hard to see. Now coming back up top, final thing in the back seat. We do have a one touch light. The door is open, so it's gonna stay on right now, but you can just touch that with your finger there to replace it. I'm sorry, to activate it. It is LED, so hopefully the replacement's minimal. And then if you look over on the side, the hooks, there is a handle overhead that you can reach to get in, as well as a hook that you can hang uh, hanger style clothing on uh, should you need to do that. Now that we're out of the vehicle, let's take one more look at that gas tank cap. And I am going to go ahead and lock the truck with the remote. Heard the honk. And yes, I can still open the gas tank lid here. I wish that actually locked with the rest of the car. It looks like it should right here, but that doesn't seem to actually lock out the gas tank. A little bit unfortunate if you ask me. Now on top of the truck, the one detail of note here I want to point out is the radio antenna. It comes with this spiral, it is flexible antenna. And to me, this just looks so out of place. I don't even know why you need this and the shark fin. You can buy a little stubby antenna here to shorten this down because this may or may not actually hit a garage opening if you're going through it or a parking garage. Um, so I'm gonna, probably gonna order the shorter stubby antenna. I'll show you a video on that whenever I do that and make that switch. Uh, that should just be a simple plug and play change, but I'm really not a fan of how massive that antenna is there. And so that's your look at the 2024 Ford Ranger Raptor. For more videos about this truck, how it drives, performances, upgrades, accessories, maintenance, and so on, click the subscribe button. If you like videos like this, give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching, and as always, have a great day. Bye.